So welcome again to Zoom into Archaeology. Um, my name, of course, is Nicole Grenan, and I'm the host of your Zoom into Archaeology programs. Um, but I'm very excited today to welcome Sarah Miller, who is the FPAN Regional Director for our Northeast and East Central regions. And her office and home is based out of St. Augustine, Florida. And I won't give away too much about her presentation, um, but she's gonna be talking today about the history and archeology span and many interesting facets of Kingsley Plantation over in Northeast Florida. So Sarah, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Nicole. And it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Hello, and, and new friends. So what a fantastic thing we can meet together in my now home office. Um, just a note, I am at home. This is live, so if my dog goes off or kids need something, I may need uh, just a moment, but hopefully it will go through pretty smoothly. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen quite a bit, um, but you'll see me pop in and out in between, and hopefully you can still see my face, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, let me share my first screen, and of course I can't see the slides. I can't move them without this thing. So hopefully you are seeing the first slide of the presentation and I can see the way to advance them going forward. Um, so today I was asked us to talk about, well, really Nicole said, what would you like to talk about? And I thought, oh, I'm really missing Kingsley Plantation right now. It's a site that um, I go to every year. We would normally be doing teacher training workshops. I see Emily Palmer is on the line today and I uh, don't know if we have any other rangers, but would like to hear from you guys later and we may be able to answer some questions too at the end. So glad that they're here. And that's the topic I picked for this time together. I did wanna do a quick temperature reading and just see how familiar are you with Kingsley Plantation and see if I can pull up. If you want to react with a clap, if very, or if, uh, no, I can't see you without that, but clap if very, thumbs up just a little, or react none if you are excited to learn about this new site or you can't find your react button. That is also allowed. Uh, yeah, and that's how to navigate down there to the reaction button. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is uh, the chat feature. If you click down on the Zoom to chat, I should be able to see your questions. I'm going to focus on the presentation while I'm giving it, but if you have questions that come up during, go ahead and answer. Or if uh, anyone else knows, jump on, feel free to respond, and I will look at those at the end to scroll back through and see what uh, unresolved questions we still have. So do use that. And you know how a lot of presentations, they might say, uh, they, they might hold to the end all the resources you could want to see. But I like you guys, so I gave you a little cheat ahead of time. If you look in that chat right now, there's a link. And I put all the links that I'm going to show and use on the screen today into a blog post, so you can go ahead and access that, copy that, put it into your browser later. And um, if you're looking for something, that is a good place to start. Uh, so starting to put the presentation together, and I was thinking of first impressions I had of Kingsley, because it, it's not open to the public right now. So please correct me if I'm wrong in the notes. But uh, just the essence, the overpowering presence of the site when I first went to visit there. I moved to Florida 15 years ago. And these are back from my very first visit pictures to Kingsley in 2009. So I got to get familiar with um, the layout of Kingsley Plantation. I was out there with John Whitehurst. Here's the classic objects in here are closer than they appear with a beautiful golden orb. <laughs> got to get close up with the wildlife. And then realizing that Kingsley is part of a larger park, the Timaquan historical and ecological preserve. So getting to see some of the um, prehistoric and Timucuan interpretation they have at the site. We got to go over to Fort Caroline. Um, the aquatic nature of the site is so important. You're surrounded by water most of the time when you're out at the preserve. 
and then going to meet the staff that work in the curation facility. So a lot of the artifacts that we're going to talk about today, if your question is, where are these artifacts or where do they end up? A lot of them are likely in this curation facility that's located on MPS headquarter property, not at, at Kingsley itself, but if you're interested in researching and doing more, you might be able to go and get access and look at those artifacts yourself. Uh, and then the day began and ended back at Kingsley and looking at these beautiful uh, tabby, tabby cabins that where the enslaved people lived during the time that Kingsley was there. They were doing an interesting thing that day and I haven't seen it again where they were trying different methods of trying to preserve the cabins. So we'll talk about preservation of the site a little bit at the end. But in, even in my first introduction to the site, I knew that the cabins have some environmental dangers they are protected well from development right now, but that might not be the case for other archaeological sites. So it's a good place to have that conversation too. How do you preserve what we have from the archaeological past? Our very first Archaeology Month event was at Kingsley Plantation. So this is back in 2007. James Davidson was doing field work out at the site. Uh, we had a couple of packed barn rooms of uh, visitors who were enjoying presentation and it was really important that people could hear what they were finding out each year because a lot of visitors came by they are excited about the archaeology going on and they don't always get to hear the end story of what what they found out and what research is still going on today um, these are some staff members that worked for us 15 years ago uh, Matt Armstrong in the center who's now a preservationist out in Oregon and our first outreach coordinator, Christy Pritchard. So it's not really the main core of this presentation, but I, just a little nod that how we interpret and understand the site changed a lot over time, over 15 years. For example, these are the first panels we worked on to do uh, what, what the archeologists are finding out. And you're gonna hear lots and lots about this chicken burial discovery, but that was featured even then in our first public event that we uh, had an opportunity to participate in out there. And today I post this on our Facebook page of 2007, St. Augustine Archaeology Association members went out to visit the site and there was a public day and it's a great time and got to meet the archaeologists and see what they were up to. Uh, here's Emily Palmer, here we are during a teacher workshop and some other panels that we put together, they were um, using the format of what was to come out of Kingsley. So we were really happy to help get this uh, up-to-date information about findings from archeology span going on at the site up and for the public to view. So I'll return to this at the end too, but it's just so important to the, understand the diversity of the people that were living at Kingsley. And this uh, panel here has this map showing um, the location of where a lot of those who came to live at Kingsley came from, and also some of the historical documents that we have learned about their origins or what happened to them when they came to Kingsley. And then of course the artifacts, and we'll dive into those a little bit too, but just looking at what are the cultures of origin of the people who came to live at Kingsley? How do we know what are these cultural traditions they were able to maintain? And looking at that, diaspora, that dispersal of culture all over the world and how that's expressed right here in Florida. Um, so I'm going to pause for a second to show you a video. Hold your breath while I get it to share correctly. But um, this video is about five minutes, but is a nice overview to show you different parts of the site. I thought you might enjoy listening to a different voice than mine also talk about the location of the site and uh, it's in the links that I gave you so you can go back and watch it again or share with others if you want. I will warn you there's a lot, uh, a nice blast of um, Florida folk music at the start and then you'll hear Emily Jane's voice which is a little quieter. And I'll go ahead and share this screen. Everything's optimized, great. Duval 
County was owned and operated by Zephaniah and Anna Kingsley from 1813 until 1839. During this time, their slaves lived in an ark of cabins, all equally distanced from the house. After the Kingsleys left, African-American squatters moved into the cabins for some time. Eventually, the property was acquired by the National Park Service and opened to the public. The plantation house still stands at the site today, but unfortunately is not accessible to the public. A freestanding brick kitchen has been refurbished and equipped with an interpretive display. Ruins of a sugar mill were also found in the woods. The site features 25 of the original 32 cabins. The cabins were built by slaves using building techniques they brought with them. They are constructed out of tabby, a type of cement made from oyster shells. The shells were retrieved from a Native American shell ring also on the island. Because of this, some of the walls contain Native pottery sherds. The cabins are simple two-room buildings with a brick fireplace. They are in various stages of preservation. Some have all four walls practically at their original height, while others are merely foundations covered over by the forest. One cabin has been restored to its original form. Well, uh, archaeology at Kingsley Plantation has uh, been sort of uh, um, an ongoing process since the late 1960s uh, with Charles Fairbanks, uh, his first excavations in, uh, at Kingsley in 68. Uh, uh, really the first, uh, kind of the birthplace of African American archaeology, or at least plantation archaeology, with a focus on African American uh, context. Dr. James Davidson of the University of Florida has been excavating a Kingsley Plantation for several years. Kingsley Plantation on Fort George Island is a very special uh, site because in part of uh, Zephaniah Kingsley uh, himself. It's his Afrocentrism, it's his uh, ability to see uh, beyond race and racism uh, and be able to see Africans as people that is most interesting and that's what people were captivated by in the 19th century and that's what in part draws people to Kingsley uh, today. Through archaeology, we can see some of his Afrocentrism, some of his um, uh, uh, kindness or his uh, basically uh, allowing uh, these people some little freedoms. Uh, and you can see that uh, in several different ways. We know that uh, he allowed them religious freedom. He uh, did allow them to budget their own time. Uh, so uh, he worked on the task system. Uh, if they had time at the end of the day, they could do their own uh, work, their own labor, their own leisure time. And he did allow them to sort of feel invested in themselves uh, and their families on the land. Uh, basically, uh, each uh, cabin was a, um, a nuclear family, uh, and um, they had privacy. They were able to lock their own uh, dwelling houses. Uh, they had access to um, firearms. They were able to protect themselves and their families. Items found in the floors of cabins include blue beads, cobbles, and iron, all charms for good luck in some African beliefs. The remains of posts were found behind a cabin, suggesting a back porch, an area not visible from the plantation house. Evidence from the site helped draw many conclusions about the lives of Kingsley's slaves. Uh, we wanted to look at cabins that we knew were occupied during Kingsley's tenure on the island, 1814, uh, 1839, uh, and we lucked out. We did find uh, cabins that had been um, occupied during that time alone, so they were not occupied after Kingsley leaves for Haiti in 1839. Um, and we were looking for, uh, for African identity, African religion, and we were very lucky. Uh, in 2006, uh, in the first uh, summer we uh, excavated at Kingsley, we did find uh, evidence of uh, an animal sacrifice uh, in the form of a chicken, that a hen that had been killed uh, and uh, the blood had been spilled, presumably, uh, and buried uh, in the floor of the slave cabin very close to the, the wall and the wall trench, so it is very suggestive of a sacrifice that would be associated with a uh, dedication of the structure. Kingsley Plantation is open seven days a week from 9 until 5. Admission is free. For more information, check out their page at the National Park Service website, www.nps.org. I think I did it. How exciting. I can navigate through these windows. <laughs> All right. Um, so that gave you a little background and um, 
the site and the history and some of the archaeology that's gone on and also shown how our engagement and public engagement has changed at the site over the time, over this time. But um, I think what really sets a clear map forward to how do you understand um, the people living in the past with archaeology, I wanted to dive into our investigating a tabby cabin curriculum. This was done in partnership with the National Park Service, the Teacher Ranger Teachers, with a UF, with James Davidson, and for um, other FPN staff members and National Project Archaeology. So it's a set curriculum, and you can see why archaeologists love it, because uh, science teachers, social studies teachers, these are concepts that may be difficult to uh, get across in curriculum or maybe some of their favorites, but it's something that archaeology does really well for trying to build these concepts in learners of all levels and uh, what we can, you know, further learn about the site, learn about the site, learn about the people, but also expand those skills for ourselves. So if you're participating in a project archaeology workshop, you can do lessons one through eight on your own or in a classroom, don't necessarily have to visit the site. You're building up the main skills that an archeologist uses uh, as they do their work in the field, observation inference, classification, a lot of skills you saw in that previous slide. Uh, here's just one example. These are the infamous doohickey kits of how you start to not just classify things and realize a lot of things that we classify and define, they're useful to us, but we really come up with a lot of these categories. Pottery is a really good example. We've kind of made these types that we know by heart and can roll off our tongue what they are, but really they are a collection of different traits that we have observed and put together. So we have a shorthand for talking about them. And that happens in archeology span all the time. So we go through lessons one through eight, building up those kind of skills. And then the investigation, um, that happens lesson eight, we can deep dive into one site. So a couple of years ago, probably more than five now, we did this for Kingsley. We did the uh, investigation curriculum, and I think it just touches on sites and understanding sites in a way that's different than just showing you um, some of the things that we found it kind of builds the explanation for why it's so important. And every investigation through project archeology span is so important, it begins with a descendant and the importance of the descendant community. Uh, this is one of two project archeology span curriculums that talk about those who are enslaved and is really unique feature for us in talking about understanding and teaching about slavery. Uh, I love the story of Deborah Bartley Wallace, who is a descendant of someone who lived at Kingsley, but she didn't know that. A lot of her history was lost to her. She didn't, she probably wasn't walking around thinking, I'm a Kingsley descendant. So she visited the site, saw a photo of her Aunt Easter, um, Easter Bartley, and was putting those pieces together. So I think it's so important, not only why do descendants matter? Why do our ancestors matter? But what it means to learn this about yourself and the connections she's made in her own life uh, with the things that interest her. And um, we'll, we'll return to that again at the end. But it's great that she's the first person we're introduced to as we're doing the Kingsley investigation and understanding the geography. Uh, Kingsley Plantation, here's a little map of Florida with a section of Northeast Florida. So some of you may be in Pensacola. I saw some of you are in Jacksonville and St. Augustine, but it's in this, you know, upper right hand notch of Florida near, near um, Jacksonville. And Fort George Island is really best understood as a site in itself. You can break it up into Kingsley and Fort George Club and the mission sites, but really, if you think about the whole island as one site, you start to get a more cohesive idea of how people met their basic needs over time, what did they have access to for flora and fauna, and then finding out how important it is that um, sea island cotton can be grown there, what a huge impact that had on the community that came to live there. 
And this is why the site can really only exist in this place. If it was somewhere else, they might have adapted and met their basic needs in other ways. So it really ties and connects Kingsley to this very specific island, the estuary environment, and the temperatures and the building materials that are unique to this site that we find as archaeologists. Uh, sea Island cotton found there, and in our workshops, it's nice to be able to, to touch it. They have these long, delicate threads, and it's um, very different than other cotton found in other areas. Uh, the next part of the investigation looks at historical documents and photographs as primary resources. We really have the students, the teachers, ourselves, really compare and contrast between the photos and ask what time of year was these, were these taken? Why did somebody take this photo? Who's in there? What are the artifacts that you see that they're using? Uh, what questions do you have? And really start to dig a little deeper uh, and seeing some of the people who live there and also with the documents. Some of these slides are from an interactive online investigation that currently only exists in these slides. We're trying to figure out how to get it reposted and up there, but it's nice that uh, getting at the interactive idea of how you look at and translate documents. This is um, below nephew of Zephaniah Kingsley wrote this note and gave it to a slave named Jimmy. So what he's asking permission to do there and uh, does not want to be relocated to Savannah, Georgia, separated from his family, and is a really important piece of primary resources that we can look at to try and understand those who live there. Uh, after meeting Deborah and talking a little bit about the history, we're ready to dive into the site. As you heard in the video, the site is really the first place that um, plantation archaeology was examined the first place where they were really starting to be much more interested in who lived in the cabins, the lives of those enslaved, than the main house, or then, um, you know, the, the prominent white landowners. So this pivot in looking and focusing on those who were enslaved in 1968 is very important for archaeology as a whole, and also important to the site as far as its history of how long it's been um, excavated and looked at. So these are images from the Florida Museum of Natural History. Uh, trying to figure out why these cabins, if you saw in the video, they're in this really unique half park orientation and starting to ask questions about why that might be. Uh, does it have to do with uh, drivers, the overseers, with security, with defense? What are other reasons that these cabins could be in this half art and experiment with the time and place and the STEM components of the engineering of the site? When you're out there, it's wonderful to walk around and get an idea of the uh, footprints of the cabins and the geography and what you're looking at. So trying to bring that a little bit to you today. Archaeology, many of you know this, we're we're looking for artifacts, we're looking for traces of people, but we're also really looking for these features. What are the footprints of different structures that might have been there? If we find post holes, as this one is from a TP investigation, but if you can excavate and find artifacts in there, it will help you date when the structures were built or rebuilt or improved upon and for Kingsley, this is really important, looking at the uniformity between cabins, what was the chronology of when they were built. Not all the cabins when you're walking around look the same. Why are some different? How are they used in different ways? So that's some of the work that was done by James Davidson's group when they were out there was looking to contrast and compare different cabins um, that they found. When you're out there, you can talk about the dimensions of the site, but it's also built into the curriculum how to, uh, yeah, how to measure. So you can measure out the dimensions and really think about how many people lived in each cabin, how much space are we talking about, and start to get a, a feel for the dimensions of the site. And there we are enjoying a, a site tour by Emily on one of our teacher workshop days. 
Uh, then we start going into the artifacts, into investigating a savvy, a savvy slave cabin. And the, the, the takeaway from this curriculum, what can you learn about the people who live there by studying their shelter, by studying their house? There's a great kickapoo phrase that's used as inspiration by our buildings, by our houses, you will know us. So how does knowing and understanding uh, slave cabin help us understand the lives of those who were enslaved there. So artifacts are important because they're objects made and used by people and of the time that they were used for Kingsley Plantation, but also um, where they are found in the cabin and in the site is crucially important. And that's why archaeologists spend so much time excavating, measuring, mapping, photographing, so the artifacts are information that tell us about, you know, what time, how old that button dates to, how old the nail dates to, um, how old the pipe stems are, but where are they found in the cabin? Does that also show us about how humans, how the people who lived there used the site, how it was different across different cabins, and gets a, a little bit deeper into human behavior. If you were experiencing this in one of our workshops, we would have a big tarp, out on the floor and you would be mapping your quadrants and maybe cursing little pieces of paper that we have to represent the artifacts, although we've been able to 3D scan and print some of them so you can have a physical object to look at and in your hand. Uh, but for the online investigation, and what's probably easier to imagine today is looking at the interactive and you could actually with this trowel go and excavate different quadrants and look at um, what was found where it was found and starting to think what it was used for. Why are all the clothing items found near the fireplace? Why are uh, pipe stems and other things found near the doorways? Uh, this shows um, when we mentioned before that when Charles Fairbanks was there, he was looking for ties to cultures from where people lived and originated in Africa. And some of the examples they found were house charms or uh, other artifacts left in specific locations. This is showing a deer tibia that was found in the doorway in one of the wall trenches back in 2006. And then um, blue beads, which are often found associated with African-American sites. And uh, some of these axe, axe heads, the iron, uh, turns out to be very important in connection with other house charms or religious traditions found at other sites outside of Kingsley, but also within Kingsley, some, um, some diversity of where those different house charms are located. Uh, the curriculum takes you through today, what the cabins look like today and how important it is to preserve them. They're really setting you up for, in this curriculum, to think about um, why does it matter to protect certain sites? Who are the stakeholders involved? Uh, how to have that three minutes matter in a public forum to have a town hall meeting and advocate for these sites. So talking about how they're preserved today, why they're preserved today, and that's an interesting part. It's always been part of my experience at Kingsley and then trying to uh, preserve these really unique structures. And this gives you a nice photo, um, a nice comparison of what it looked like in 1875 to present day where one has been restored and has uh, more fleshed out what they may have looked like back in the 19th century earlier. This is a not very used part of the curriculum, but I love this idea. How can we take what we learned about the cabins at Kingsley and apply that to today's architecture? How could you, living in Northeast Florida, make a home that, um, that helped, you know, circulate the air or have components related to what we found out about how people organize their space at Kingsley. So it's not often used, but it's a really interesting idea. And, you know, we think about it a lot with climate change. How did people adapt? How did they react when their sites were being flooded or changing so much in the past? And even today, it would be great to see more places 
use that information in things like architecture rather than just stealing their names where, you know, what, closer to us we have Halifax Plantation, which was a historic site, but now that's what they call the whole housing development. And they could have used many more ideas from that site than just uh, borrowing its name. So we know it works great with um, teachers and those we've done the workshops with. These are some nice testimonies from teachers. Culture can be difficult to explain to younger children, but this was uh, made it clear. I like the archeological sites on um, sheets, activities in the next room. Uh, the artifacts in the quadrant activity can be applied to math, attributes, et cetera, the Jacksonville history that we have right here. But I wanted to share just personally some of my takeaways from the archeology span at Kingsley. This chicken burial, when I saw it back in 2006, um, just blew my mind. I'd never really seen such an intact, and I've worked on human burial sites, but I'm just terrified to think what I would have done coming down on some of these chicken bone remains, the patience, the tenacity of the researchers to leave them in situ, recover them, pedestal them, photograph them, record them. And the chicken burial also was found with uh, an egg and I uh, believe an amber bead and a piece of iron and James Davidson and his writing. And that's in the link that I sent to you. Does a great job connecting that to even contemporary um, sacrifices made in living cultures today. So just seeing that cultural connection of how that cultural idea spread and was maintained and preserved here at this site is just really special and is really one of my favorite artifact features in the whole state. Very early on, you can see this is from 2006, and it happened every year after, they found evidence of firearms, gun flints, and, you know, that's very different for a site where you're not thinking that all the inhabitants will be armed to the hilt with firearms, but that tells a much more complex story about the site, about meeting basic needs and security, uh, what Kingsley's relationship was to other people who lived on the site, um, what were some of the other threats and dangers at that time. So really is interesting evidence that they continue to find and try to explain each year. And then just returning to the importance of Deborah and the descendant community is really um, just so well done just thinking if you had to protect this site, who would be the number one voice that could really explain uh, what the site means to them, but also help for protection and preservation? What are the other intangible ways that people connect with the site? Uh, it's just a very powerful story for me to see uh, Deborah and Esther as part of this um, continuity of people who have used and had a relationship with the site in many different uh, ways that's experienced. Channeling to the day of discovery at Kingsley Plantation where they found um, burials of those who were enslaved and the very careful work they did to announce that discovery to other descendants and to the community. Um, but that's had a lot of impact. We don't have many African burial grounds per se in the United States or in Florida that are preserved. So what did, what did they find out, but what did that mean to the descendants and to us that their burials are preserved and there and still being studied? They um, were not removed from the site, but some information notes taken so that uh, more research can happen and connect with other African burial grounds. Uh, one in Key West, one in um, New York, uh, again, they're very rare sites. And recently, we had visitors from the Caribbean Heritage Network, and thank you so much to Emily and Cece who came out with us that day. Uh, I've done a bit of thinking on what the site means to descendants who are local and in Florida and the Southeast, but in my head, I hadn't really connected how the story impacts those in the Caribbean 
and what it means to them, not only to connect and see the site, but how well it's interpreted with the people who live there being front and center when you visit. I mean, that's the reason you visit Kingsley Plantation, to learn about those who were enslaved and what their lives were like, and for that to be the true focus of the archaeological efforts, the historical efforts, the preservation efforts, uh, is really quite unique. So thank you to them for making time, and I know it was an impactful day for those visitors as they go back to interpret sites, many of them plantation sites in the countries they live in. So these resources are loaded up into that blog already ready for you. So click on that first one and um, all the rest are there. I also gave you some blown up copies of those panels because I didn't connect the dots that the site is not open. So you can't, I, I could tell you go visit and go see, but just not yet. <laughs> but you can see those panels online. Um, some of the resources I'd like to point you to, first and foremost, is the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage uh, Corridor Commission. And uh, these are the, the, the descendant community of Kingsley, of those enslaved in the Southeast, and just learning about their people, their culture, their language, is just really one of the most enriching things you can do if you're interested in learning more about Kingsley and those who live there at the site. They have a lot of events, a lot of virtual events, uh, a lot of discussions and um, related to food or historic cemeteries, or uh, they'll have an annual conference that will start back up next year. So that's a great group to be aware of and participate. Um, if you're interested more in the, uh, the Kingsley curriculum, um, Emily Palmer, James Davidson, and I have a chapter in this Understanding and Teaching American Slavery volume, and we're the only archaeology chapter in that volume, so I really hope there would be more and uh, interesting lens to look at, and really, I think this is what Kingsley does best for me and from the public I work with, is really uh, having deliberation deep discussions um, about what happened there and what people's lives were like um, in a way that you know, just don't, doesn't happen at um, many other sites that I've experienced. So uh, that's a good resource. Uh, virtual field trips. I, you guys watched our video today and some of that information could probably be uh, updated. But today, you could participate in a virtual field trip thanks to the um, NPS and Tim McCorn Preserve. And I put this link as in with that page of links that you can contact Emily and have ranger guided field trips um, when they are available. So please visit that. Or she's on this call, so if you have questions about that, you could uh, ask away and, and we'll get to it in the comments. Um, the Tumaquan Preserve has a Facebook page, so please check it out. It's a great way to see what activities, what's happening there, uh, and appreciate the rangers and the work that's happening at the whole park, not just Kingsley. And I'm perfect. This must be you, right, Emily? Uh, Fort Caroline National Memorial featured this the other day, and that's just a, a fun um, account if you are not following them already on Facebook. Uh, this is not quite related to Kingsley, but we are doing a tea and trowels um, program during COVID. So I think we're up to 25 different interviews with different archaeologists and answering the same five questions. And those are uh, available on YouTube, included, I think, in the link that I set out. But you can check those out if you're interested in learning more virtually online about archaeology. And of course, you're friendly FPAN page, whatever region you might be in. I wanted to point out we have a download our archaeology map button on the Northeast page that features Kingsley and other sites you might want to visit when you're in this area. But if you're not in this area, check out um, other regions and we have our virtual activities also posted on our upcoming events if you want to keep track of those. So thank you, James Davidson and University of Florida field students who have been doing all that work over the years. Uh, Emily Palmer and any other rangers we may have on the call. It is a sadness. I'm not connecting with you. 
in person face to face this summer, but I'm excited that we can resume our workshops again next year. And thanks to you, Nicole, for facilitating and organizing these kind of offerings because it's uh, it hurts our heart to not be seeing you guys in person this summer, but how great we can share information and our excitement for the past together in this forum. So now's a great time if you haven't navigated there already, find that chat button and uh, enter in some questions. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go there. Oh, fantastic question. Look at this. Oh, I'm seeing some you are correct from Emily. That's great. Uh -oh. Good fact check there so far. Um, when will they open up? And trying to go through. Uh, here's the link reposted there. Do we know when Kingsley might open up? Um, I don't know if Emily's still here. Well, that's interesting. It says your speaker is not working. Does it mean your speaker, Sarah? I don't know. My speaker. Uh, I can hear you now. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I just good. turned it on. Uh, so we're working to get uh, the park reopened in phases. Um, we're following all of our federal guidelines and um, using the data to kind of guide our decisions. And so whenever that is, we will be happy to share it as soon as the decision is made on all of our web platforms, um, social media outlets, um, and uh, we just are following the, the federal guidelines that we've been given. Um, yeah, and there's a question on here about why the main house isn't available for tours, which we get that question too when we're on site. So Emily, do you have a, a good response for that? Or And now it is more accessible. Aren't there certain times that it's open? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we've expanded access on the weekends. We used to do um, limited uh, tours for small groups at certain times that you had to make reservation for. We have shifted that to more of an open house um, where at certain times of the day it is uh, accessible to just walk through and there's usually a volunteer or a ranger there to answer questions. Less of a formal guided tour where you're there for an hour more of a, a gentle walkthrough, uh, but it all relates to the age of the structure. It was built in 1798, making it the oldest still standing plantation house in the state of Florida. Uh, we wanna keep it that way. We wanna keep it still standing. And uh, if 100,000 people walk through your house, what would it look like? And that's our annual visitation. Uh, we we uh, are trying to be conservative in the wear and tear on the structure, which is part of why it is limited. Um, so much of that house is original. When we wander through it, you're seeing floors laid by enslaved craftsmen and carpenters. And someday we may have to replace those floors and put in a uh, uh, something very similar using those same methods, but that's not the same as being connected to those original people. So we're trying to keep it as original and intact as possible for as long as physically possible. And so one of the ways that we've chosen to manage it and to do that is to in fact limit a little bit of the foot traffic. And before you mute your line, I think we have a nice combination of questions that are related to what were the working conditions of those formerly enslaved people who continue to live at the site after emancipation and then someone else who's a similar question of, um, okay, well, what artifacts do we have? How do we know about the task system? And um, I'll help with the, uh, what kind of rituals were allowed in private and secret, but any early impressions to share there, Emily? And I'll pull some resources while you're responding. So oh, I will say uh, working conditions, uh, working outside in fields in Florida on cash crops. 
uh, you can imagine what those working conditions are. It's, it's tremendously hot. It's humid. It's uh, buggy. It, it, I mean, they're difficult working conditions in the best of conditions. It's an enormous amount of labor being undertaken on uh, what they called the homestead in the post-Civil War years. So a uh, plantation is defined by slavery. Um, you know, it's not really a romantic term. I don't know why people are naming neighborhoods after it, um, but it changes its name. It's called the homestead post-Civil War. Um, there are still um, agricultural efforts going on in that time period. And a African-American field hand working this is a general fact of in the South. I don't have the exact wages paid at the homestead on Fort George Island, but in general, an African-American field hand made half of what a white field hand would have made for the same amount of work, for the same day's labor. Their pay was half that. Um, so that speaks to the working conditions. And I will say that when Rollins, um, who owns the property, he moves down um, to Fort George Island post-Civil War from uh, New England. He's a northerner. Um, I think they have a term that they use for people who moved down south from the north, but he uh, hired many of the formerly enslaved people uh, and they worked for him for a period of time at the homestead, but then he talks about how all of a sudden a bunch of them moved away, which implies that as soon as people were able to earn enough money to make choices in their own life and to have options, they did that, they, they moved. There, you see this mass migration from the South to Northern industrial centers like Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, New York, uh, because a um, washerwoman in New York City made in a week what an African-American field hand living in the deep South made in a month. So that you see this migration from Fort George Island um, John Rollins then proceeds to hire a group of immigrants. Uh, he agrees to pay for their passage over, and then they'll work for him on the homestead. And uh, when they arrived, they said, uh, thank you, but no thank you, and left very shortly after. And he, he sees this tumultuous turnover of labor over and over again. So a lot of people were not enjoying working on that particular property in the post-Civil War years. Um, now, the task system question. Uh, we know a lot about Zephaniah Kingsley's specific views on um, directing labor, on uh, religion um, amongst uh, the enslaved people, and um, a, a lot of that comes directly from Zephaniah. He writes a treatise where he proposes uh, what he sees as the right way to enslave others. Um, he, it's a pro-slavery writing, um, but he argues for these little liberties to prevent rebellion. It is not, I, as, I mean, not to criti criticize Dr. Davidson, I wouldn't call it kindness. He argues for a very pragmatic system where people don't violently revolt because they have these tiny little liberties that are given to them. Um, it is a means of control, not a means of charity. Uh, he writes this all in his treatise, but it's supported in a lot of other documents. So, um, you know, we know he, 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 there's evidence of the firearms in a legal encounter where one of his uh, enslaved people named a Abraham Hanahan um, basically says, yes, the enslaved people at this property have guns. No, we're not going to give them to you. Um, they're our owner's property. Um, and that leads to Abraham Hanahan's arrest and uh, forced hard labor. Um, and so we have the legal records of that. Um, so we have more than just Zephaniah's writings. We have other writings of his contemporaries. Um, we have a lot of his wills and, and other um, probate records. And then that's all shorn up and supported by finding the actual stuff in the ground. You know, it's one thing for him to say, oh, they had access to guns. It's another thing to find flints over and over and over again. And I think that's uh, other evidence for the task system too, that um, when their uh, tasks were done at the end of the day, that's perhaps another interpretation of why we find so many gun flints is that they are 
given that, not to use the word freedom, uh, but in this instance, go out and um, find food for themselves or meet some of their basic needs in those hours after that time. Which also speaks to his business savvy though, because then he is not providing that food for them. They are providing that food for themselves. So uh, I, again, I don't wanna say that, he, oh yes, he's very magnanimous. He's, he's enforcing slavery. He just thinks he found a more clever way to do it with these things that made him different from other plantation owners in the area. Um, one of the other artifacts is not included in the curriculum and it's um, a little complex to talk about in the time we have, but uh, there was excavation done of a well behind one of the structures. Um, there was dissertations to follow that was looking at comparing and contrasting the front yards of the slave quarter cabin versus the backyard. What could have been done out of sight, out of view, kind of getting at some of the questions that were in there about what, what we don't know, what we didn't see. But in the base of that well, it was so deep. It was one of those OSHA, all right, we got to get out the scaffolding. <laughs> we got to do it right, getting all the way down there because uh, normally a deep well, you would find a lot of artifacts. You could find huge house cleaning episodes, but I believe what was found really only was at the bottom, a very smooth stone that was interpreted as an offering to the goddess of water uh, that had continuity from um, other sites in Africa and with um, contemporary culture. So that's just one other artifact and they did um, they cored it. They tried to find the origins of where the stone came from. David Marcus did that work and I believe West Africa. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. exactly. It was not from Florida. Yeah. So uh, in the time we have, that's maybe another good artifact to point to to show um, you know, just the diversity of different objects. And in some cases, we don't know for sure. That's just an uh, interpretation given. You know, in this time of Black Lives Matter, and it would be great to have a whole nother zoom into archeology span where we discuss, okay, how do we decolonize a lot that we have used and understood? And certainly it's not fair to James Davidson that we bombarded him in his office with a video camera 15 years ago, and that is what we used because I'm sure he would also like the opportunity to update and revisit. Uh, but some of his publications are in that link that I gave you guys, his Google Scholar artifacts. And he was known to me before I came to Florida for looking at charms that were used in African-American burial context that did align with some of the WPA narratives as well. So looking at, okay, how do you make sense of the objects you see, especially when it's maybe not been uh, published or written about in uh, going back a hundred years ago, traditional historical forms. Um, how, how are other ways we can get at that information? Excellent. Well, we oh, are. I, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I would add on um, some of the written ways that we know about the, the rituals. I mean, Zephaniah writes about how he actively doesn't want um, the people living at Kingsley Plantation to practice Christianity and that he encourages the continuation of their beliefs um, because he thought to convert to Christianity, this is a direct quote, they would become dissatisfied with their lot in life. Um, if you think about the Christian Bible, uh, that, that whole Moses section is pretty anti-slavery in its message. And again, he's using this freedom of religion, like, oh, you can continue practicing your faith, as a means of control because he doesn't want them to be exposed to ideas that he seems, sees as dangerous and he wants people to um, think he's given them something. You know, oh, here, you can continue your traditions because I'm so kind and, and, and it's, it's not kindness, it's control. So he writes it and then we find the, the artifacts that support uh, we don't just believe everything he writes, um, but it's when you take those historic documents and pair them with what we actually find there in the sites um, that we get a more rich and full narrative. Well said, well said. 
Um, well, I'll stay on the line for a little bit and if there's more questions, but thank you very much to Emily, our surprise guest speaker, <laughs> and to Nicole for helping facilitate and arrange. And it's just so lovely to see so many people on the call today. Thank you so much for joining us. And what's up, what's up next, Nicole, for your next Zoom? Yes, yeah, so we, um, I'll just remind everyone again, if you have other people who might be interested in this presentation, or if you just want to revisit the amazing information that Sarah and Emily have provided us, uh, you can find all of these presentations um, on the Florida Public Archaeology Network YouTube channel. It usually takes me a couple days to go ahead and get it uploaded <laughs> after the talk, but it will be there no later than Monday of next week. So that's available. And um, Emily, do you have uh, virtual projects coming up, events for Kingsley that we could plug to? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, the uh, Gullah Geechee Commission, the Corridor Commission that you already plugged, um, is, has actually invited Ranger Ted Johnson um, to give a presentation this uh, Saturday in a similar format at 2 p.m. Uh, you can find the link to that on our Facebook page, which has already been supplied by Sarah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a really great resource and uh, spend more and more time visiting their page. Awesome. Yeah, so um, definitely join that if you have the opportunity. We've also got um, next week for our Zoom into Archaeology, we've got another really interesting talk from FPAN staff member Rebecca O'Sullivan, who works in the Tampa area of Florida. She and uh, uh, Cardno, which is a contract archaeology firm, and archaeologist uh, Eric Prendergast from there are going to talk about the history of black cemeteries in Florida, um, how many of them have disappeared over time or how they've been relocated, um, focusing specifically on Zion Cemetery in Tampa Bay. Um, this is a cemetery that's been uh, in the news a lot recently in that area, and FPAN has played a part in some of the work that's going on there. So we have a really exciting and very interesting talk with some great speakers next Thursday, uh, same time, same place. You can register either through the FPAN Facebook page uh, or the Northwest Region Facebook page. Um, you can also find it on the FPAN uh, main site as well, fpan.us. So Sarah, I don't know if there's anything else you want to wrap up with or plug or... I'm just, uh, delighted everyone was here. Thank you. Yes. Thank uh, hello. You. Excuse me. Yeah. This, 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 this is Ted Johnson. I, I just wanted to chime in. First of all, excellent job from everyone. Very interesting. Um, I, with the um, FPAM program, I wanted to let everyone know that um, I had been working with Emily before um, with the CRYPT program. And uh, she was working with the Gullah Geechee folks at Cosmo. And we were trying to arrange uh, a crypt session there. Today, uh, the Palm Springs Cemetery, that same cemetery, uh, was voted um, through the, the state review board to be added to the uh, National Register. So I'm hoping we can work with you folks again to actually schedule uh, one of the CRIP sessions there. Uh, I did actually plug your program during the session, so just working together as partners. But if you folks can consider that and, and revisit the uh, adding uh, uh, Palm Springs Cemetery uh, to, to the list again, I mean, we can work together on, on, on getting that. It's a great program that you folks have at CRIP. It's, it's fantastic. I'd say that's uh, the very first one we want to do as soon as we get a green light we're allowed. We are looking into how to do um, virtual crypt workshops. They're really great in person and all the different parts to it, but we're going to really tackle it even at next week. We're going through the whole agenda. How can we do breakout rooms? How can we make it interactive? What kind of um, um, components could we have people go outside either distance or on their own to do in the afternoon? And Cosmo is just such a special place to us. Uh, the, I had another point about um, uh, the, the last crypt we did was here in St. Augustine uh, at San Sebastian. And that was to honor the African-American cemeteries. That was the theme for Archaeology Month. 
and we did have a member of the Gullah Geechee community that was with us. So uh, it makes so much sense to me that we, we closed out our public programming with a crypt at that cemetery, and it makes perfect sense to pick up when we are able to and head first to Cosmo. Sarah, I don't know if real quick, for those who are unfamiliar, do you want to maybe quickly summarize what crypt is? Yes. Uh, it's the idea that cemeteries are outdoor museums. How can we learn about the laws and ways to protect them? How can they be managed? How can we uh, empower advocates to not only take care of and learn and study, but preserve that site? And our goal is let's keep it in place at least another hundred years. What, what are the Sure, there's a lot of repairs that could happen to this, but what do we need to do to, no messing around, keep this above ground and intact for the next hundred years? So I think it's a, it's a really targeted program, and I think people enjoy going out and doing the hands-on components as well. Yeah, and I see your note, Tracy. Um, I think the issue of African-American cemeteries is its own, uh, <laughs> we used to not use the word epidemic lightly and now we're in one uh, health wise but it's 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 um, a shame what's happening everywhere and the failed burial bill hoping to pick that up again next legislative session because it really does need a task force or more coordinated um, eyes on how to how to stop this how to shed a light on it. And the federal burial bill, if you want, you can contact your local representatives because the federal burial bill is still on the table and still being read and hopefully will be voted through this year and provide uh, a little like the Network to Freedom, the Underground Railroad, how it is funded. It would be a similar structure as proposed for that and could maybe open up grants or coordinated bodies to look more at the larger issue so that not each individual cemetery has to take it on on their own. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll add really quick too, you know, if there are groups of, of cemetery um, stewards and communities that are interested in having FPN someday in the near future do a crypt program, um, all you have to do is get in touch with an FPN staff member and we'll direct you to the right person. And we're always thrilled to be asked to come and do these training programs. So that's an option too. Just shout out to Cynthia. I see you there. We, we connect by Zoom very often. So it's making sense to me to end my evening this way. <laughs> yeah, sending you hugs and love. All right. Well, I, I think unless we have any other questions or comments, I'll just say again, thank you so much to Sarah and to Emily for this fantastic talk. Um, maybe we'll have you back again sometime in the near future since we enjoyed this one so much. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> All right, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you next week. If you can't join us, of course, always check out our YouTube channel for these presentations. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful Friday and a great weekend as well. Thank you.